Yes, well, good morning. It's it's morning for me. It might be as late as 6 p.m. if you're on the East Coast or even 11 p.m. or later in Europe. For me, it's 3.11 p.m. West Coast time, which is still morning for me because I stay up all night to do YouTuber stuff. Um, it's, it's just how my schedule works. So, yeah, I friends... I'm coming to you live from the new computer in 1080p with my full monitor display and no lag time and everything is running happy and there's there's no there's no CPU, there's no heat overload. We are in the clear. We are running at barely any, you know, 10% of the computer's capacity. So guys, thank you. You've come through for me. I'm in great shape. However, <laughs> there's always a, a silver lining, even to happy clouds, uh, or maybe it's a black lining, I don't know. I did lose, um, I had just recorded the Ice Spiders video, I did lose that in the transfer, um, so I had to re-record it. Uh, what, what, is, what is dead can never die, but rises harder and stronger. The Ice Spiders performance has risen again, harder and stronger. Um, I re-recorded it. I made the jokes funnier. It, so you you will get like a 5% better Ice Spiders video. But yes, Alicia Patience, I did have a moment. I was like, no. I was like, where's the file? Where's the file? Where's the file? I'm like looking around. I'm like, oh, I'm not going to find it, am I? I'm, this file is gone. So I, I'm not sure what I did, if it was my fault or if it was the computer's fault. But uh, in any case, my San Francisco 49ers... Hey, Jeff Garcia. We pulled off the upset, so I am here again in San Francisco 49ers gear. And yes, thanks for bearing with me. Those of you who are here live, I started a bit late, blah, blah, blah. I do have a cool topic to uh, to discuss today, though. Oh, yeah, it's a net positive, at least. I'm good. I, uh, I, uh, I didn't get too bent out of shape about it. I got the new computer. Can't be upset about that. And, uh, you know, I just used the opportunity to Make it better. <laughs> so that's what I did. Um, Lord Luke Lightbringer, using the Super Chat function, which, guys, I do appreciate Super Chats and PayPals. In the link in the description right below the video, there's a link to the PayPal. If you want to do a one-time donation, you don't even need a PayPal account. It's very easy. Um, and you can send a question with that. I check those throughout the stream. And uh, it's very nice for me because the questions stay queued up, and then I can rip through them and... Yeah, and then you can also use, of course, the super chat function. Thank you very much. Like Lord Luke did. And I think if I should be able to um, put his comment up on the board. Where's the comments? Oh, it's right there. I'm using the new Ecamm software. So yeah, I can take this super chat. And boom, just stick it right on the screen. What are your thoughts on Avatar The Last Airbender? Um, I watched a few episodes of it, and I could see there was some cool stuff going on, but it was a little hard for me to get into. Um, I don't want to call it a, a kid's show in a derogatory fashion. It is obviously you know, a very cool kid's show with a lot of lore built in. I don't... I don't necessarily, I'm not a huge cartoon guy, um, anime, all that stuff. Like, I do a little bit of it here and there. I just haven't been exposed to a ton of it. I couldn't really get into Avatar. Um, I, I won't say anything bad about it. I just was just a little bored. So, didn't grab me. I didn't press on very far through it. I, I do understand there's cool stuff about the moon and fire magic and all kinds of cool stuff. But, uh, yeah, I don't really have too much to say about it. I gave it a whirl. But uh, my time is precious, so I just I couldn't couldn't do it. Um, yeah, and uh, let's see here. Are <laughs> trying to see if the Rams are gonna choke up, cough up this game to the to Tampa or not? Uh, but no, what we're here to talk about today is um, is uh, ancient religions of the first men. Right, the first men are very strongly associated with the weirwoods and. Um, the Green Seer magic, of course, we know all the northern houses still pray to the Weirwoods, so this is 8,000 years of unbroken cultural tradition in some extent. And of course, we know that 
many first men and probably all of them in ancient times do give blood offering to the weirwoods. They sacrifice people to the weirwoods. There's a couple of different quotes about that. Uh, so the question is, what were the religions of the first men before they adopted the weirwood religion? Because of course, the green, you know, worshiping the old gods, the weirwood trees, this is all children of the forest stuff, right? Um, and we're told that the first men adopted the religion of the children of the forest basically wholesale after the pact. Um, and of course, I've got some timeline heresy about that, which I'm going to talk about. Um, and even before that, uh, well, not even before that, but the question is, what were the religions of the first men before they adopted the worship of the old gods and the weirwood trees, right? So there's a couple of clues about this, and there's I've got some a couple of theories I'm going to break out. So first of all, let's talk about the idea of the pact itself. I, I, I went into this in a lot more detail in the Timeline Heresies video, The Pact and the Hammer of the Waters, but I do want to sum it up real quick. Um, when we're talking about ancient religion and cultural shifts, the th <laughs> what we're told here is, is really fascinating. Um, the idea that the first men or oh, I've, like, uh, whoever they considered themselves, I don't think they would have called themselves the first men, but the various tribes of people which we refer to as the first men, they were told, were told that they warred on the children of the forest for centuries or perhaps even a few thousand years. They crossed the Arm of Dorn into Westeros, and we'll talk about where they came from too, possibly near the Sil Silver Sea. They crossed into Westeros, they warred on the children of the forest, they cut down the weirwood trees and they gave them to the fire. And it says the war went on and on until finally the, uh, the green seers gathered in the Isle of Faces and they committed a bunch of blood sacrifice, potentially children or potentially captive humans. They fed them to the weirwood trees, so mass blood sacrifice. This supposedly powered the hammer of the waters which broke the Arm of Dorne land bridge and prevented any more first men from coming into Westeros. And possibly the, uh, the neck was drowned at the same time, or possibly uh, this was a different Hammer of the Waters event. It's very unclear. I think George is intentionally creating a fog of history thing where we just have these two different legends about the hammers. Uh, one is that it was called down from the Isle of Faces and struck the Arm of Dorne. The other one is that it was called down from Moat Kalin and drowned the neck. But that one also makes it sound like it's the, it's the Hammer of the Waters one too. So it's very foggy and we don't know uh, if there's two Hammer events or one Hammer event, at least from the mythology that's presented to us. Um, now the cool thing about, the, <laughs> about all this is that the Maesters invite us to question... Um, let me just make sure I'm, I uh, said something about the resolution of the stream. just want to make sure we're good here. Let me know, if, guys, if there's any issues or lag or sound issues. Uh, just let me know. I'm, I'm, uh, yeah, I'm doing new stuff today. So the thing, the maesters invite us to question this reasoning about the pact and the hammer because they, they point out, like, it doesn't really make sense for the children to break the arm of Dorne after the first men had already been crossing into Westeros for centuries. This is a classic case of closing the barn door after the horses have escaped. And for those of you who don't live in the country have never heard that, uh, it's just what it sounds like. You keep the horses in the barn. If the horses escape because somebody didn't close the barn door, it's not doesn't do a whole lot of good to go and close the door afterward because they're already out. <laughs> so this is kind of kind of what we've got going on. Um, a little bit of lag. I think it's my internet connection today. Uh, let me, oh, I know what I can do. Hang on. I can pause the stream. Yeah, I was uh, streaming my own stream here. Let's see if that will help. <clears throat> All right, so, um, uh, where was I? Uh, yes, uh, right, so the barn door. Horses escape, doesn't do any good to close the barn door. This is kind of what the, they're saying about the hammer of the waters. It's like, well, the children were 
already had been fighting with the first men for centuries. Westeros was full of first men. And so what's the point of breaking the arm of Dorne? It's literally, it's the children are the, those who sing the song of Earth. They're typical fantasy elves. They're symbiotic with nature. They dress in flowers and leaves and they look like several different animals. These aren't the type of creatures that are going to scar up the earth in order to try to save their own bacon. That goes against everything we're told about the children. When Bran meets the children, they're like, yes, it's, you know, our sun is setting. We're ready to go quietly into the night. It's okay. Our time is done. And we've lived here for a thousand, thousand years and all that stuff. So unless that's a total acting job that they're pulling or something, or maybe there's different factions of the children or something. It doesn't really make sense for the children to have broken the arm of Dorne. It doesn't fit with their philosophy. It didn't make tactical sense, right? Um, so then, <clears throat> then we have the fact that if, if the children can use blood sacrifice to create earthquakes, this is my favorite point to make, why didn't they just do smaller versions of the Hammer of the Waters on the ring forts of the first men, or perhaps where their armies were gathered. The first men did like to build ring forts, which means they con they're not um, nomadic people, they're sedentary people. They like to build ring fort, hunker down, live there, maybe build a castle. So they're sitting in one spot. The children literally could have just walked out of the woods, crossed the way from the castle, sliced the neck of a couple of captives, and then create a small localized earthquake and mess up the ring for it. And honestly, if you're the first men and you see the little woodland elves coming out of the trees and then doing some magic and the ground starts shaking, like how many times do you think that's going to have to happen before you're like, okay, I'm getting the out of here or at least suing for peace or negotiating or something like the power to create earthquakes is a power that the children easily could have used to win the war against the First Men, had they wanted to. Let me just check on the... Oh, did they just... Oh, wow, the Rams are going to win this. Look at that. Um, so, this, so none of it makes sense, right? It's like, oh, well, we have this earthquake magic, but we didn't use it until we we're just about to lose. Then we made a giant earthquake in a place where it didn't matter. <laughs> like, there's just so many problems with this, okay? And finally... It also doesn't make sense for the first men to adopt the religion of the children of the forest just because their war came to a place of stalemate, which is what we're told. They negotiated, and the children took the deep woods and the caves and things, and the first men took all the open areas and this and that. That doesn't, that doesn't create a need for the first men to adopt the religion of the children, does it? That's usually not what happens. Like, you negotiate with an enemy, you surrender, be like, oh yeah, your religion sounds really good. Screw our gods of our ancestors. Let's just, you know, that doesn't make sense. So, you put all this together, and it's, it's pretty easy to make sense of it once you have the moon meteors. Which, of course, we, uh, we myth heads have the moon meteors, if we have anything. So, um, and can I get some Cleo emojis to calm poor Cleo in the room? Uh, who's a tut tut tutting for all she's worth. And those are, for, of course, we have special emojis for our channel member squishers, our channel member squishers, so thanks to all my squishers. You can see they got the name in green and a little squisher icon next to the name. And that's for the low, low price of $5 a month. Hit that little join button right down there and become a channel member squisher. Get one free super chat question a month. And you'll be helped supporting the channel. All right, so uh, put Nimble Dick back in the box. Um, yeah, so, what was I saying? Uh, so how do we make sense of this? Well, moon meteors are the answer, okay? Hammer of the waters, can the children cause earthquakes? Maybe. They sing the song of earth, so could they make the earth shake? That's not, that's not unbelievable at all. That's not the problem. The problem is all the other stuff I said. They don't have a motive, it doesn't fit with their philosophy, and why didn't they do it earlier, right? <clears throat> At least to get through emojis, you gotta you gotta join you gotta hit that join button. You gotta pay me five dollars a month through YouTube, and then you'll be a channel member, which is on this channel that makes you a squisher. And you can see all the squishers have their names in green, 
and they have a squisher icon which changes the longer you you stay a member it changes you move up the ranks so uh you got different different squishers in there in any case <laughs> so meteor strikes can cause something like the 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 arm of doran collapse that's what i'm trying to say um it's it's uh it used to be uh, an isthmus of land, or penin not a peninsula, but a land bridge, I guess is the right word. Um, and a meteor strike, not only would, would uh, not only can it collapse the arm of Doran there, but of course meteor strikes can throw off the weather patterns, which can lead to sea level rises and, and falling too. But the main thing is that George has given us a big clue by naming one of the islands in the Step Stones, which is the remnants of the arm of Doran, Bloodstone. And of course, the Bloodstone Emperor is remembered as causing the Long Night in the East, and he worshipped a black space rock that fell from the sky during the Long Night. It's one of the biggest clues about Moon Meteors, the entire Bloodstone Emperor story. You guys know all of that. So, Arm of Dorne, it could, it could be caused by a meteor strike. The Bloodstone Island is a big clue. And then there's a bunch of other scenes where there's symbolic fights going on with Moon Meteors, and people get their arms broken or cut off. Uh, and I've, I've found some more clues for the Arm of Dorne that way. Check out a very old podcast, Bloodstone Compendium number four, um, the, ha uh, the Mountain versus the Viper and the Hammer of the Waters, by the way. So, here's the thing. The Arm of Dorne breaks. If it was caused by a moon meteor, then that means the Arm of Dorne broke when the Long Night fell. Not 4,000 years or whatever before the Long Night. See, we are told the chronology is intentionally screwed up. That is what I am proposing. We're told the Arm of Dorne and the pact between the First Men and the children that this all happened thousands of years before the Long Night. I say that's rubbish. If the Arm of Dorne broke by a moon meteor, then that means it happened when the Long Night fell. We also know the children of the forest saved the First Man, the First Man, the First Man's. The first men's bacon, <laughs> all the men's of the first men's, their bacon was saved. Uh, we, you know, the children, the last trio was searching for the children, hunted by the others, sword broken, companions dead, and then we know the children somehow helped the last hero, helped the first men of the Night's Watch uh, rally to defeat the, the others in the War for the Dawn. And after that, we know the men of the Night's Watch, they, uh, the, the ones that are first men, which would have been all the first Night's Watchmen, they swear their Night's Watch oaths to the trees. To the trees, right? Which means the Green Seers. So the Night's Watch, they're pledging to the Green Seers their lives and their duty and all the stuff. Why would they do that? They would do that because the Green Seers are the ones who saved humanity during the long night. It's, that's not even a theory. That's, that's, it's very clearly spelled out. And I can turn this off now because the Rams won. Yay, Horned Lords. Um, so, this starts to all make sense. Why would the first men abandon their religion? Well, the Long Night, as I like to talk about, is a cultural bottleneck. It's whatever social orders and governments and kings were in charge, they would have lost their power because society would have quickly descended into chaos, um, starvation, just absolute anarchy, and not the good kind of political anarchy, like the actual chaos anarchy. So whoever on the other side of the long night is going to be new institutions, new kings, new cities, new organizations, new everything, because it, again, a bottleneck means most of the people would have died. If there was literally six to 12 years of darkness, no harvests, and the others are attacking, it means most people died and the survivors, again, saved by the children of the forest. So now we have a mechanism to explain why the first men would adopt a new religion wholesale. They might have perceived their old gods as failing them, not the old gods, but their previous religions, which we're going to get to, having failed them because, you know, the long night fell. This is the kind of thing people would interpret as the wrath of the gods, certainly. The sun going dark, meteors raining down, all that stuff, right? <clears throat> so the children help save the first men. And when we talk about the pact, well, I think this had to do with the creation of the Night's Watch, probably, because the Night's Watch, again, the first men of the Night's Watch, 
pray their oaths to the green seers in the trees and have been doing so for 8,000 years since the long night. That sounds like they made a pact, right? And we also see that the first, first man kings who established houses like Stark and perhaps Lannister and others were probably green seers and skin changers. Obviously, Brandon the Builder is suggested as having learned the language of the children of the forest, which means he probably gained their magic. And the fact that the Stark kings always have direwolves at their side going all the way back to the beginning indicates that they were skin changers from the beginning. So I think that's not really surprising anyone for me to say that. Um, let me just find the mute button real quick. I'm also going to go get Cleo real fast. She's uh, losing her shit. One second. And uh, you're just going to have to laugh at me for drinking straight out of the gallon-sized Snapple jug today. I'm running late. I didn't have time to even grab a cup. I live by myself currently. So, uh, yeah, you can laugh it up if you want, but that's what I got. So, this is how I explain the Pact and the Hammer of the Waters. The Hammer of the Waters is a moon meteor. The Pact was essentially formed during the Long Night or right after the Long Night when the First Men would have been essentially scattered, their culture destroyed, and when they would have owed a great debt of gratitude to the Children of the Forest, right? So that all makes pretty good sense to me. And it also ties the idea of the First Men cutting down the trees and warring on the children with the creation of the Others in the Long Night. That's what the TV show went with. Of course, that's probably a very simplified version of the book, Truth. But that's what the TV show said. The, the children were hard-pressed by the first men, and so they created the White Walkers as a weapon to stop them. Um, there are clues that something like this has happened, of course, in the books as well. Asha Greyjoy remembers tales she heard as a child uh, of the wars against, uh, between the first men and the children when the children of the forest turned the trees to warriors. That's definitely something to do with the Others and talking about the Others' origin being created from the Weirwood Trees. Now, when it says the children did this to get back at the First Men, I do think it's a little more complicated than that. But my whole scenario with Azor High invading the Weirwood Net basically has Azor High as the transgressor, right? Sacrificing Nissa Nissa, a child of the forest, theoretically, perhaps other green men, invading the Weirwood Net, corrupting it. So everything Azor Ahai is doing, in my version of the canon, is violating the children and the green seers. And so I've said that, you know, Azor Ahai became Night's King, and he is the father of the others. But essentially what I'm thinking of is Azor Ahai is running into the Weirwood Net to take power, and then it's Night's Queen, who may be Nissa Nissa, who sort of turns the tables on him, uses his magic to create the others, who then fight against Azor Ahai's former allies, meaning the, the First Men, the Great Empire of the Dawn people, the Dragon people, and then you have this others versus human struggle. So, <clears throat> that's my head canon. And again, the um, Timeline Heresies video, The Pact in the Hammer of the Waters, is where you can find a much longer explanation of all that. But whether I'm right or wrong, we're still left with this question of what were the religions of the first men before this pact? And I've got a couple of super chats. So first of all, Crimson Templar has become a squisher. Let me see if I can put that one on the screen. Oh, I need to make it longer. That's what I need to do. Totally, here we go. 
Crimson Templar just became a member. Thank you, Mr. Crimson Templar. And John Merkel sent in a super chat. Your stream with Grey Waste Tim made me think about the first men and how they supposedly came from the oldest city, Kadath, or near there, and then walked Landbridge style. It makes sense when you think about Eldrick's name travel versus Nefarion, etc. <clears throat> so I'm not sure if you're crossing an idea that uh, Grey Waste Tim might have mentioned with something from the World of Ice and Fire. The World of Ice and Fire suggests that the First Men may have come from the Silver Sea area, which is now the Dothraki Sea. Um, Kadath, of course, is in the very, very far east, and that's a Lovecraftian reference. It's one of the oldest cities in Lovecraft world, if not the oldest. I forget if it's Carcosa or Kadath. They're both way older than humans or something like that. Um, but, of course, the, uh, some of the first men, or maybe even people that got there before who we think about the first men, would have come from the Great Empire of the Dawn. So, John, if you want to clarify what you were getting at there, I'm a little, I'm not sure I'm entirely getting the, the Nefarion reference, so follow up with that if you, if you want to drill down further. <clears throat> Let's see here. Okay, so let me pull up my email to make sure I'm staying on top of that. Yeah, I got a couple of PayPals. Thanks, guys. Uh, June, with just a thank you appreciation PayPal. Thank you. Thank you, June. And Daniel asks, yes, I've, this is the place I can put the question. Correct. In the comments field of the PayPal. You got it. So, do you do any world building yourself? If so, any suggestions on world building religions? If not, what's the thing you like to see the most in world built religions in A Song of Ice and Fire especially? So, yeah, like many of Song of Ice and Fire fans and YouTubers, I'm definitely what you would call an aspiring writer. Um, I'm planning to do a fantasy series set in uh, what I call pseudo-Atlantis, meaning it's not trying to be real Atlantis, but it's my version of Numenor, the Great Empire of the Dawn, Atlantis. Everybody always puts those civilizations far in the past of their story. I figured it'd be fun to try to write the downfall of such a society, and then it can relate to all my ex American experiences to that. So that, that's what I'm going to go for. Now... Uh, one second here. Let me actually grab a lozenge. So yeah, religion, world building religions. I do like to think about world building quite a bit. And it's got to work. It's basically just needs to be a force that drives the world. You need to think about the culture, like Ironborn culture is probably a good example. Um, they have their CPR resuscitation thing that they do where they, they drown you, quote unquote, and then bring you back to life. They give you the resuscitation and they, they consider that to be a, a death and rebirth, sort of a harsh baptism. But then, of course, we have Patchface, right? Patchface actually seems to drown and somehow come back to life only he's only partly there, but he also now has visions from the spirit world and stuff like that, right? So it's pretty easy to see that whatever the Ironborn are miming with their ritual, Patchface is probably the truth behind it. So it tells you that in the ancient, in ancient Westeros and ancient times, anything that's magical can give rise to a religion. And this is a great segue into the meat of this... Uh, of this topic, so thank you. So, for example, we have the Relorist fire religion. <clears throat> fire is a source of magic. All the basically all the elements in this story: water, air, earth, ice, fire. They can be source, and obviously blood can be sources of magical power, or at least mediums through which you can channel magical power. And so, naturally. We have an entire religion of fire worshippers that's sprung up. And they have beliefs based on the way that fire magic acts. They can do resurrections. They can do they can transform human physiology, whether it's Mokoro transforming Victorian's arm into some sort of charcoal hand that's sort of smoking all the time, but it's stronger somehow. Or Melisandre 
transforming her physiology through the use of fire magic. And check out the Melisandre Secrets series for that. So, um, the drown, you know, the Ironborn, the reason why there is a religion about the drowned god and water magic is because water magic is real, right? It's because you can drown people, bring them back to life with magic. There's a kind of <clears throat> water magic. Um, we also know the Roinar are able to use water magic in their wars against Valyria. They're able to sort of channel the water out of the river, if you will. Uh, I forget what exactly it says, but this is definitely a factual thing, not a rumor. There was thousands of Roinar and they warred against Valeria. This is a matter of record. The Valerians used dragons, probably fire sorcery, and the Roinar fought back with water sorcery, but, but lost. Is Victarion's arm full of fireworms? No, absolutely not. Um, when Araya has the fireworms in her, it makes her sick and weak. You can see them moving around. They grow quickly and then they break out. Um, Victarion, there's no worms moving around. He's stronger, not weaker. It's not getting worse. And there were no worms on the ship. I don't think Makoro carries around little worms in a box to like inject into people. So no, I kind of hate that theory. <laughs> it doesn't work. Um, however, uh, the, the simple fact of what's going on there is shows us that the Rolorists, again, can transform human physiology with magic and so that's what we have it's 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 looks like pork crackling it smokes um it blisters and cracks when he makes a fist but it is in fact stronger <clears throat> so let's see here um the ironborn again there seems to be some sort of truth uh yeah there's also no smoke coming out of victarian's nether lips thank you isabel lamego <laughs> The fireworms kill you. Like, Araya only lives that long because she's a Targaryen. They have some sort of raised capacity for heat, being the blood of the dragon. But even she dies, too. So uh, that's not a that's not a something that, that uh, Victarion could keep under wraps. So there seems to be water magic. There seems to be a water resurrection. Both of those things. Just as we see ice magic and ice whites fire magic, and fire whites. So then we have a, a culture, the Ironborn, who lives on the sea. People who live near the sea tend to have more storm and sea gods, of course, in the real world. But, of course, but again, in, in A Song of Ice and Fire, there is magic. So most of the sources of the religions are going to be actual magic, not just random belief sets. That's, that's kind of what George is doing. He's Asking the question, in a world, in a world where sorcery is real, religions would no doubt follow that magic. And that's what we see happening. So, Guilty Undertaker asks, I wonder if the Roinar water magic is related to the OG drowned god. So here's what I'm saying. There is no drowned god. There is no R'hllor. There's no gods in A Song of Ice and Fire. The only way that there's gods is if people or children of the forest green seers or something become something more than human. So maybe maybe the great other is the spirit of Azor High residing in the Weirwood Net. Okay. Um, something like that could be possible. However, there, there really does not seem to be gods. There is nature magic. So, yes, water magic is water magic wherever you practice it. So the Roinar are going to use water magic and come up with their own set of beliefs and uh, around that magic, whereas the Ironborn are going to do something different. And, of course, when we look on the east coast of Westeros, we find other beliefs around water gods and water magic. So check this out. Let me pull up my notes here. I did make some notes today, very quickly, at the last second. So, this is Hoster Tully's... Well, we'll get to the East Coast. This is in the Riverlands first. Um, this is at Hoster Tully's funeral. Of course, the, uh, the Tullys, they, they dress in fish armor. They dress up like fish people. Even though the Ironborn are more famous for things like names of, like Dagon, 
course, Dagon is the original Sumerian fish god. There's a Dagon cod. There's lots of fish human mythology around the Ironborn. However, the Tullys have it too, and the Tullys are first men. So the Tullys, they uh, they dress up in fish armor. But then check this line out at the at the funeral. It says, and then it was gone, drifting down river still, perhaps or broken up and sinking. And this is Hoster's funeral barge they're talking about. The weight of his armor would carry Lord Hoster down to rest in the soft mud of the riverbed, in the watery halls where the Tullys held eternal court, with schools of fish their last attendants. What now? Watery halls? The Tullys have watery halls? Volume low. Um, oh, I see what I did. Sorry. I turned it down. How's that? Oh, that's... Let me give you a second to adjust. In case you turned your speaker up and now it's very loud. And now we're doing ASMR. Hello, everyone. All right, sorry, I didn't mean to creep anyone out. So, what, what, what? The Tullys have watery halls? This is interesting. That phrase, it's the same phrase. It says, the watery halls where the Tullys held eternal court with schools of fish their last attendants. This is, uh, let me see here. Let me pull up the watery halls line from the Ironborn. So, damp hair, Aaron damp hair, he actually does drown out at sea and manages to survive. So, he refers to himself as having seen the god's own watery halls and returned to Televit. But there's something else about fish being attendants, too. And, um, you know, Patchface talks about under the sea, all the serving men are crabs. Um, Asha says, there are no trumpets in the drowned gods' watery halls. Below the waves, the merlings hail their lord by blowing into seashells. So we've got these similar ideas, even in these very different, like the Tullys don't seem anything like the Ironborn, right? However, this is a very same belief set. So you could imagine that if you go back far enough in time to the ancient days of the first men, again, perhaps before the cultural bottleneck of the Long Night, and you see why I set up all that Long Night stuff first, perhaps the, the, the water religions were a big deal. You see it with the Tullys, you see it with the Ironborn. You also see it, again, on the East Coast, both with um, the ancient uh, Durandan kings and with the Borels of the Three Sisters. So, guys, let me grab something real quick. I'll be right back. Let me, let me give you some art to look at. Um, actually, no, I don't know how to do that easily on this thing yet, so just one second. Apologies, folks. I, it's terribly unprofessional to have the dead airtime. Uh, would my beloved fiance Minty was here in California, she would make me tea. But now I've got to make my own tea, and I haven't moved the electric water heater upper over to my old spot here. 
So I've got to run and make tea. Very sorry. Very sorry. Um, I did get a new battery for the theremin. And I almost hooked it up this morning. And then I was running late. And I panicked and just said, fuck it. But you know what? Where is that thing? Um, <clears throat> ah, here it is. So yeah, I'll just change that while I let my tea boil. So let's see, where was I? Um, so yes, if we go all the way over to the east coast of Westeros, we find more people worshiping the goddamn squishers. You knew that was coming. <laughs> I almost did this stream in character as Nimble Dick. But, uh, yeah, I just, I think it would have been too loud for me, for like, for my own brain <laughs> today. Well, that there sounds like a super chat there, man. I'll be damned. Super chat from the wayward white walker. Indeed. Squeaky wheel gets a greasing. Thank you very much. Um, I'm lapsing in and out of nimble dicklish now. Oh, that's good. Nimble dicklish. Uh, we're definitely going to need uh, a nimble dick uh, icon. Okay, so I promise, I promise, nimble dick emoji by next stream. Okay, so I thought it was the teapot. No, oh, the tea is ready though. Uh, yeah, let me let me grab it. Hang on one second. Again, terribly sorry, folks. Terribly sorry. <sighs> I was up all night. I really did a good Ice Spider recording, and I could have gone to bed at like 4, but instead I stayed up literally all night till like 6 in the morning uh, recording. So my voice is a little tired. Need the tea. Uh, yes, yeah, so. Oh, cool. You were halfway through the Iceberg video when you saw I was live and came on over. Awesome, man. Uh, lots of new people finding the channel recently. Thank you very much. Um, if you've made it through 60 seconds of silence, that means you, you're you into it. So thanks a lot. Um, yeah, and there's a lot of a lot of material to get through if you're just finding the channel. So yeah, with, with, uh, with COVID, uh, not lockdowns, but people still staying home more. Some places have lockdowns, probably more places. I don't know. Let's not get into that. In any case, if you need, have time to kill, then you found the right place. Uh, yes, yeah. so let's go over to the East Coast and find more squish worship. Storms, Lord Godric said as... Lord Godric said the word... Oh, sorry, let me start over. Storms, Lord Godric said the word as fondly as another man might say his lover's name. Storms were sacred on the sisters before the Andals came. Our gods of old were the Lady of the Waves and the Lord of the Skies. They made storms every time they mated. He leaned forward. These kings never bother with the sisters. Why should they? We're small and poor, and yet you're here, delivered to me by the storms. So this is uh, Lord Burrell of Sisterton. Obviously, is a colorful figure. They, um, <laughs> what's cool is they, uh, they, uh, <laughs> they're kind of a little shady. Sometimes they light the the night lamp to help sailors stay off of the rocks, and sometimes they don't. <laughs> Sometimes they lure people onto the rocks and steal their shit. And of course, the Three Sisters have been the home of pirates going back for centuries and centuries, right? So, here we have a confirmed old 
religion of Westeros. He's talking about before the Andals came, and so he's essentially telling us that the faith of the Seven has replaced this religion in the region of the Sisters. So the Sisters are, are uh, attached to the Eyrie, which of course is a faith of the Seven place. There was a giant war between the First Men and the Andals in the Vale, of course, which we should break down for symbolism sometime. But we have, okay, so Lord, uh, what is it said? Uh, Lady of the Waves and Lord of the Skies. So the sea and the sky. This is very like the drowned god and the storm god. Um, again, the ironborn, the ironborn are bros. So both gods are male and they're just dudes fighting it out. Nothing homoerotic about that at all, at all. Shout out to NFL football. Um, so then over in not ironborn land, we have the, the, the sea and the sky perceived as god and goddess who mate and create storms together. So it's, it's a little different. It's not the storm god and the sea god. It's the sky god and the sea god, and they together make the storms. So it's just different, in, um, different ways of interpreting the interaction between the forces of the ocean. If you live near the ocean, you're more concerned with that than, say, nature gods who dictate farming because you're, you know, living off of sustenance mostly if you're, if you're a seagoing people. Uh, I've got a couple of good PayPals here or super chats, which I will grab. Um, but I want to make one point real quick. Um, Storm's End, it seems that the first men of the Durandon hold a similar theology. They talk about Elenai, the daughter of the sea god and the goddess of the wind. And of course, Durin, the human figure, which we'll talk about more in a minute because he's got green man stuff going on, he essentially, he steals Elenai, right? The daughter of the gods for his wife. It's a mythical tale. Elenai is, is seen as the daughter, again, of the sea god and the goddess of the wind. So the gender is flipped from what we just heard about on the sisters. On the three sisters, lady of the waves, lord of the skies, okay? And that's usually sea gods, like the ocean is more associated with femininity, but not always, obviously. Poseidon is, is very manly. So in any case, so the genders are flipped. Same idea, though. Here, the, uh, the, the, god, the sea god is male, and the goddess is the goddess of the wind, and their daughter is Elenai. And of course, these two gods, the sea god and the goddess of the wind, they can make storms too. They make storms to send against Durin for stealing Elenai. So just as the Lady of the Waves and the Lord of the Skies can make storms, so too can the sea god and the goddess of the wind from the Durandon. So this all fits together pretty well. You can see there's a common religion stretching across the waste of Westeros, the midpoint, from the Iron Islands. To, uh, let me do the map from your perspective. The Iron Islands, Riverlands, and then the Sisters, and then below that, Storm's End. I guess I could pull up the map. That would make this fun. Let's see if I can... I need to figure out how to do my screen share anyways. And let's get these Super Chats also. A couple of good points I saw. So... Um, a Magic Cat member, for, Squisher member for four months says, uh, use their, their free, um, like I said, if you're a Squisher, you get one highlighted message per month for free. And a Magic Cat has used it to say that the Sumerians from the world of Conan, which is a George influence, worshipped a storm god called Krom with a magic hammer. And the Sumeri of A Song of Ice and Fire are likely a nod to them. Yes, definitely. Perhaps George gave them a similar religion. So we don't really know anything about the Sumeri, um, except for I think they're the ones that made metal. They're, they brought the metalworking to the Roinar equation, uh, which could be a nod to the Sumerians from Conan. Yes, exactly. It's definitely a hat tip to Conan. Um, and, and Krom, that's a name that was, that's think that's taken from Irish folklore, Krom Kruach, uh, who is, I believe that's an Let's see, let's see who he is. Pre-Christian Ireland, yep. Um, 
According to Christian writers, he was propitiated with human sacrifices, and his worship was ended by St. Patrick. Um, e is a storm god. Uh, uh, Krom means bent, crooked, or stooped, and is perhaps related to Kruim, meaning thunder. Sen means head, and by extension, head or chief. A Kruach means, um, refers to a stack, generally, of grain. So he's a storm god and a harvest god, very like Baal, if you will, is what it looks like. And that's, again, just me taking a cursory glance here, so don't, uh, don't, call, don't call me an expert. But and it, it, it's, So that seems to line up. A storm god in the Conan universe called Krom, taken from Irish folklore, Krom Kruach. Uh, George puts, uh, Krom is somebody who's manning, manning the watchtower at Deepwood Mott, when Asha Greyjoy holds Deepwood Mott. Um, Krom is the one that's up on the tower. So, there you go. Good uh, good trivia there. And then the Wayward White Walker, two-month Squish Remember, says, maybe Makoro has glamoured Victarion's hand. Uh, we learn of its strength and smoldering from his own POV chapter, and he is not so smart. <laughs> well, I don't think so. Um... The reason why I don't think that makes sense is because his hand was infected. It needed to be healed. And a glamour wouldn't heal it. And it was healed. So we're still left with a question of something else would have happened. So why would, why would you have a glamour? It makes more sense that he actually changed the hand. And like I said, it also makes sense that the Reloris can alter human physiology with their fire magic, because we see that they can raise the dead, they can animate dead flesh with fire magic. Melisandre is practicing fire magic to the point where she doesn't need to eat and barely needs to sleep. Um, so that that means that uh, she is transforming her physiology with fire magic. So to me, it's much more logical to conclude that that's exactly what happened. Makoro transformed Victorian's arm with fire magic and now it is harder and stronger. So that is uh, that is that is my theory. And no, Martin does not hate it when people make theories. <laughs> I don't know why you say that. Um, but all right, so uh, let's see here. And yes, okay, I'm caught up. And let me just check over back over to my email too. Yes, there's two more PayPal's. Thank you, friends. Jason says, I like the parallels in the story to real-world mythology. For example, Proto-Indo-European cultures having similar myths among geographically separated groups and things like the Long Night. Yeah, George definitely puts a lot of thought into cultural dispersal, diasporas, and all that kind of stuff. And that's what we've gotten into a lot in the Great Empire of the Dawn series, especially that one, Origins of the Dothraki. So... For example, um, you know how the Andals, before they came over to Westeros, it seems like their religion was a lot more primitive. We don't hear too much about the faith of the Seven uh, until they get to Westeros. We don't find idols of the Seven the way we do in Westeros. What we do find are these hammer and axe markings all over the lands, uh, the native lands of the Andals in Norvos and uh, northern Essos. And there's debate, the Maesters debate about whether it's a hammer or an axe, or they might be the same thing. This is directly taken from some of the ancient Germanic peoples um, of Europe who carved hammers. Uh, they're, they're, the culture is literally called the, um, the something, stone axe culture, I believe it is, uh, or the, just the axe culture. Let's see, what? Shoot, why don't I forget this? This is one of the main ones. Hand, uh, battle axe culture, that's it. The battle axe culture is one of the main um, groups of Indo-European hunter-gatherers that moved into Europe. Um, and they carved axes or maybe hammers everywhere. And I believe that uh, uh, Martin essentially is, um, is copying that with the Andals. So uh, that's a little cool bit of trivia. Doesn't really, not really here nor there, but it does, it does, George is showing us the Andals developing a more complex religion as, they, as their culture develops, as they come to Westeros and their culture sort of flowers, uh, which I think is pretty interesting along those lines as well. And then the other PayPal I had, good one, Jason, is from Cameron. The next one is from Cameron. 
Haven't been able to watch the stream in a bit, but slowly catching up on the replays. And let's see here. Maybe out of left field, but I was wondering what the odds are that the First Men might be an offshoot of Eastern society or at least one of the tribes of the First Men. In much the same way, there's evidence to suggest that back in the ancient, back in the ancient world, or what would become China, uh, potentially had commerce with indigenous peoples in what would be America. Like maybe the genetic potential for the blood of the others being present in the Starks came from the same genetic potential that allowed... Okay, so there's a theory that you should look up on westeros.org called The Starks Are Not First Men. And this is... Um, uh, I believe it's by a fellow called Lord Martin. And it's essentially speculating that, yeah, the Starks could be Great Empire of the Dawn people. Um, he's talking about the Northern Passage... Maybe they came over the Grey Waste, Shivering Sea, and that's where the Starks came from, from the north. Um, that's an interesting theory, <laughs> and uh, it could, it's possible. Obviously, we've talked about that Northern Passage thing a lot lately, and how George does seem to be teasing it. Um, Chief's game. Sorry, let me just pull this up here. Exeter Chiefs men's rugby? What? Oh, maybe it's not on yet. Okay. Um, yeah, the Norvashi are into battle axes too, which may be a common origin from the ancestors of the Andals. Good point, uh, Michael Rodriguez. Uh, let's see. Um, or a JT that was, sorry. Uh, now, the thing is that we know... The, the mystery is how much Great Empire of the Dawn influence is in Westeros. We know that they, um, not we know, the, the, the good evidence is for House Stain and House Hightower and maybe the Ironborn. The Ironborn obviously remember origins that are not first man origins. They came from across the sea. That really sounds like it's a memory of Great Empire of the Dawn people sailing to Westeros. After that, uh, the Lannisters are a possibility because they have gold hair, and eyes, their eyes are always described as jade or emerald, you know, very jewel-associated green eyes. And, of course, uh, the gemstone emperors all have, you know, gemstone eyes in Danny's vision. And there is a jade emperor. So perhaps that's, that's the Lannisters. Now, the Starks, the thing is, the Starks, they are almost certainly at least part Great Empire of the Dawn. Because of the last hero, right? Um, the last hero seems strongly tied to House Stark, but he's probably also tied to Azor Ahai and the Night's King as well. He may be a Dane. The Danes are great empire people. So I do think the Starks have some of that blood. Also, to the extent they have the blood of the other, that's Azor Ahai's dragon, you know, blood of the dragon, but transformed through the icy womb of Night's Queen and lots of other magic and stuff. So... The Starks, I don't call them long-lost dragon lords, but it's likely the last hero does have some Dane blood, which means Great Empire of the Dawn blood. Um, it just uh, wasn't preserved, you know, over time. There wasn't other Danes or Great Empire people in the North, just, just that one person. And maybe the last hero didn't contribute to the bloodline of Stark. Maybe he himself was half Stark and half Dane, but maybe it was his brother or sister that passed on the bloodline. And so, um, you know, a half-brother or sister or uncle or something like that. There's a few different... Uh... <laughs> There's a few different ideas there. <laughs> yes, uh, that LML guy, he, um, he, he, does ha he does have a similar taste in decor. Uh, you're right about that. So to, <laughs> there's a couple other YouTubers out there that, that have... Uh, that have uh, turned up with similar backgrounds and standing desks and other things, but we don't need to talk. Oh, and also named a lot of live streams lately uh, after things that I've named my live streams, but that's okay. We don't, we don't talk about hedge wizards on this channel. <clears throat> so, moving right along. Moving right along. Uh, yes, Last Hero had a dragon steel sword. That's another clue that there's... Magic from the East involved in his story, certainly. Um, so, there you go. 
So that's cool. We've got this water religion stretching across the middle of Westeros, like I said. Uh, Sisterton. Also, if you look at Cracklaw Point, not to, you know, bring up Nimble Dick again, but uh, always talking about his Nimble Dick. Um, Cracklaw Point, they, they believe in squisher legends, and there's the whole, the tale of the... Uh, the um, Clarence Crab and his wife was a Ursula, a witch, which Ursula is obviously associated with sea witch mythology and mermaids and things like that. So there's definitely signs of aquatic religion on Crack Claw as well, which is right in between the Stormlands and the Three Sisters. Uh, oh, by the way, my favorite part of that Hammer of the Waters heresy, going all the way back to the beginning of the episode. Remember, I said, Hammer of the Waters is a moon meteor strike. Well, whatever it was that broke the Arm of Dorne, it would have caused tidal waves all up the Narrow Sea. The Narrow Sea was previously separated from the, from the Summer Sea, and then it was connected, and there was this big explosion, either an earthquake or a meteor strike. So all of these storms that we hear of in the Durin God's Grief legend are almost certainly a mythical remembering of those tidal waves that would have come from the breaking of the Arm of Dorne. This would have been the storm of all storms, a tidal wave greater than any before or after, because you'd literally need to break an Arm of Dorne to create, to displace that much water and create a similar tidal wave. So when we hear about Durin God's Grief, who is a horned lord, we're told that the Durandan kings wore the antlered crown. So we know this stag helmet stuff, it's before the Durathians. It goes back to the Durandan. Baratheon, they adopted all the Durandan sigils and trappings and stuff. So we can think of Durand Durandan as a stag man. He's either a green man or he's somebody that's wearing a horned headdress to sort of convey the power of the green men onto himself. And he's the one who stole a magical woman from the gods, okay? That's almost the same as killing a magical woman because she's immortal as the child of the gods. But when an immortal has to marry a human, they usually become mortal, like Arwen in Lord of the Rings. That's a, that's a trope. Um, so um, this story begins to sound suspiciously like an Azor High type of story. You've got a human god king or a king who wants to become a god He's reaching up to steal power from the gods. In this case, it's in the form of a woman. And I've said that Azor Ahai sacrificed Nissa Nissa to gain the power of the Weirwoods. And the myth on its face tells you that he sacrificed Nissa Nissa to gain the power of Lightbringer. So the fire of the gods, either way. Um, so Durin Durandan, he's stealing from the gods in order to gain power. This causes the Hammer of the Waters event. It causes the storms. Well, remember, Azor High killing Nissa Nissa, that's what caused the moon to crack, which caused the long night. So either way, we have this magical sacrifice of a woman or stealing of a woman that causes a heavenly disaster, a calamity to fall from the sky. Similarly, the, the legend of the Hammer of the Waters itself talks about what? Green men on the Isle of Faces committing blood sacrifice. So again, a god-man, another antlered dude, just like Durin God's Grief, an antlered dude. We're told that the green men brought the hammer of the waters. That's just another way of saying Durin Durandin caused the arm of Dorne to break and brought those storms when he stole Elenai. It's all the same story. And... Like I said, the Isle of Faces story has blood magic mixed in, which brings us back to Azor High and the blood magic killing of Nissa Nissa. All the evidence, and check out the Weirwood Goddess podcast series, suggests that Nissa Nissa is a child of the forest. So Azor High killing Nissa Nissa starts to sound a lot like the Green Seers on the Isle of Faces, potentially killing captive children of the forest to drop the hammer of the waters. So you can see how all of these stories have parts of the truth, and they have a lot of overlap and common ideas. And you can start to piece it together that it was an act of blood magic involving green seers that caused the moon to break. So that puts Azor High in the role of either a green seer or, like I prefer to think of him, 
someone who's trying to steal the magic of the Green Seer. So he becomes a Green Seer, kind of, but he's, he's breaking in. So he's not, doesn't seem to have the natural weirwood connection, but he's, he's stealing it from Nissa Nissa and from the Green Men. Um, I'm not doing this. I swear I'm not doing this. Okay. All right. Um, I, I guess that was uh, <laughs> the theremin's way of telling me that I missed uh, a super chat from John Merkel. Um, okay. All right, then. <laughs> All righty, then. Uh, John Merkel said 9.99 uh, super chat. Thank you, John. Uh, my theory is that Jamie may be the last dragon rider, if Euron is not. Ooh, that's, that's we're going for some tinfoil here. Uh, who had better? Who has better white and gold symbolism? And George has said you don't need to be a targ to ride a dragon. Redemption arc versus the others. Well, Jamie does dream of wielding a flaming sword. That's one half of the way um, towards Azor Highness. Uh, and it's true, George has said that. I really do think it's going to be Euron or maybe uh, Tyrion for a second. I, I don't see any symbolism for Jaime riding a dragon. He definitely does have the white and gold symbolism, I'll give you that, of Viserion. Uh, okay, well, you heard it here first. If if uh, if Jamie hops on there, then uh, the John Markle gets the credit, I guess. <clears throat> yeah, the old gods have arrived. Yes, yes, they did. <laughs> Good. See, I like being in control of the theremin. All right. <clears throat> okay, so... Oh, we got another PayPal from Daniel. It's just a, just a contribution. Thank you. Awesome. Okay, so the other major religion, and I'm, I'm sort of transitioning into it, that we know existed besides the worship of the storm and sea gods and, and squishers and things like that, is, of course, the religion of Garth the Green. Now, it's kind of tied to green seers and weirwoods. We think the green men probably were green seers, and we know that Garth is said to have planted weirwoods at Highgarden. And if you can plant weirwoods... That means you can do some deep magic. Planting weirwoods is not easy. Uh, it probably involves blood sacrifice and stuff like that. So, Now, it says in the World of Ice and Fire, there's an interesting line. It talks about Garth the Green, and it says, Garth the Green is similar to many nature deities found throughout, you know, throughout the world with ancient peoples or something like that. So basically, it's, it's kind of fourth wall breaking in that George is telling us, Garth the Green is just my version of the Green Man. Um, the Green Man is a very widespread folkloric figure. We find a million different versions of the Green Man all over Europe and uh, even um, uh, Western Asia as well and the Middle East and all sorts of places. So we've talked about that extensively. Kernunos, Hearn the Hunter um, are my two favorites, but even... You can talk about Baal and Osiris as green man, nature gods, dying and resurrected nature gods. The archetype of the corn king, that's a phrase used to describe dying and resurrected nature gods. Um, holly king, oak king. Oh, look, it's about to be 420. So the maesters are essentially saying, Garth the Green, yeah, he's he is like other nature gods that are found throughout the world. So we're, we're to assume that there are other versions of Garth the Green in Westeros and perhaps in Essos and elsewhere. And that makes sense, um, because nature gods are one of the most obvious mythological constructs that you can possibly think of. Mankind's life is governed in many ways by the cycle of the seasons, especially once we move to farming, but even hunter-gatherers move with the seasons to follow the game. So everybody's life is governed by the seasons. You live outside. <laughs> it's... It's kind of important. Um, so a lot of people have perceived 
the way that nature appears to die and the green goes away and then comes back in the spring as the dying and resurrecting of some sort of green god that represents the vitality of nature. This is, you guys all know the basic stuff here. I'm just going over it so we all know. So there's there's other nature gods in A Song of Ice and Fire that are similar to Garth the Green. That makes lots and lots of sense, right? Can someone tell me if the second game is on yet? Um, or if it's or if it's on later. I don't I don't want to look it up, but I need to know. So here's the thing. There's also a green king of a go- of the god's eye. It's it's a random character. Let me just pull up the quote about this. And this is something it's interesting because it tells us that humans were trying to capitalize on the image of the green man to 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 become powerful themselves. So, in the Riverlands, they're talking about a bunch of different myths from the Riverlands in the world of Ice and Fire, and it says, "Thus, while singers and storytellers may regale us with colorful tales of Artos the Strong, Florian the Fool, Nine-Fingered Jack, Shara the Witch Queen, or the Green King of the God's Eye, the very existence of such personages must be questioned by the serious scholar." <laughs> so, there, that's, there's a bit of folklore in the Riverlands about somebody called the Green King of the God's Eye. And obviously the green men live on the Isle of Faces. At least that's what we're told. Now the Durandan kings, they are kings who are dressing up like green men, like, like stag people. And all the way up north of the wall, the wildlings have a legend of somebody called the Horned Lord, who was a king beyond the wall. So he's a human, but he's called the Horned Lord. So he's kind of implied as a god-man, at least a powerful man. And obviously, if he's called the Horned Lord, he probably wore an antlered headdress. We see that some wildlings from the frozen shore still wear antlered headdresses to this day. So, when you connect all of that, the Durandan antler people, or the Durandan kings wearing antlers in imitation of green men, green king of the god's eye, the way that everyone in the whole reach still kind of worships Garth, even after... All the other religious changes, Faith of the Seven, all that stuff, they still worship Garth the Green, okay? And then all the way north of the Wall, we again um, have the, uh, have the uh, people talking about the Horned Lord and wearing antlers. So, I would say that the worship of the Green Men, or of a mythicized version of a Green Man, Garth the Green, is very, very old. We're told that Garth the Green, in fact, was the first first man, perhaps the chieftain who led the first first men into Westeros. So what we're probably supposed to assume is not that there was one green man, but rather the first kings of the first men dressed up like green men. That's how they presented themselves. Um, were they already green seers and skin changers? That's, uh, it's hard to say. Um, they definitely became that at some point. Maybe that's when they started wearing the antler crown and all that stuff. Maybe that happened after the long night, after they started worshiping the Green Seers. But what I'm trying to point out is that the worship of Garth the Green, even though it overlaps with Weirwood shit, it's separate. Because in the North, the first men worship the Weirwoods. They don't talk about Garth. And in the Reach, they worship Garth the Green in a way that's separate from the Weirwoods. And even in the the, the chapels of the Faith of the Seven, they still have Garth. He's, on, he's up there on the stained glass, just as green men can be found on medieval churches all throughout Europe. Um, when a new religion comes in, and this is a, to answer the earlier question about world building, you should think about how the religions are going to merge. This is why I said it's so unusual for the first men to just drop their religion and adopt a new one. Usually what happens is synchronization. Or synchro- syncretization, yeah. Um, so, I, I, I don't know. I don't know if I got that word right or not. I might have put an extra syllable in there. But in any case, the things, they get merged. They get blended. And so you have a Faith of the Seven that still has room for Garth the Green in the south. And even in the Iron Islands, the Faith tried to adopt the Iron, uh, the Drowned God as the eighth god of the Seven for a little while. It didn't take, but they tried. So you can see... Um, and then up in White Harbor, they worship the Seven, but they still have old god worship. And they have a lot of aquatic imagery, old fish foot, and they dress up like 
fish people and squishers and all that stuff too. So we can see that whatever aquatic religion that was in Westeros, this has influenced the Manderleys as well. So they're actually a blend of green man stuff, because remember, they consider themselves to be knights of the order of the green hand. The house Manderley used to live on the Mander in the Reach. So they have this old legacy of Garth ideas, syncretism. Thank you. Yes, I screwed that up. Yeah, not synchronicity, syncretism. Thank you, smart people. <clears throat> so you can see how this works. The things, they get mixed up. In Egypt, once the Greeks came and took over Egypt, you had a lot of cool syncretization uh, where, you, where you have um, new versions of all the Egyptian gods that are merged with similar Greek gods, and they come up with names that are literally hybrids of the two. So it's right out in the open that they were mixing the god forms. That was okay if you're a culture that understands the, these things as mythological constructs. This is one of the evidence that the Egyptians, and some Greeks at least, didn't necessarily take their religion as literally as most people take their religion now. They understood that one people would describe the wind god with one name, and that the other pe another people would describe the wind god with a different name, but surely we must be talking about the same force. And so they would take the two peoples, again, the Greek and Egyptian ideas of a sun god or wind god or whatever, and then they would simply combine them and say, well, we must have been talking about the same thing. So, pretty good stuff there, and you can see that in places like uh, White Harbor going on. Um, and I brewed my tea like 20 minutes ago and forgot to drink it. Uh, <laughs> I have ADD, and I forgot to do the super chat thing. Must not have been 20 minutes ago. It's still kind of hot. Um, yeah. It's definitely oversteeped. One second. <clears throat> but the point is the honey, mostly, so. Yeah, let me catch up on some super chats. Sorry, I, um... I do have a couple back here. So Paul W. says, Do the genetic traits of the Baratheons and Durandans, black hair, blue eyes, stormy personalities, signify descent from L and I? Well, it's supposed to. Um, it's supposed to. That's the idea. They're the storm lords. They stole the daughter of the storm god, and now they, they are stormy. They have the power of the storm. That's exactly right. It's not something we're supposed to think about too literally it's more of a personality thematic mythological kind of thing but yes that's exactly that's exactly right paul uh parker says was military dominance of the andals the only reason why the seven was able to supplant the old gods in the south yes pretty much if the 49ers win the super bowl what do you do with jimmy g you sell him you sell him for a high number that's what you do <laughs> sell Sell high. You sell high no matter what when the season is over. That's what you do with Jimmy G. He tried to throw like eight interceptions yesterday. Man, that's just the facts. <clears throat> so thanks, guys. Oh, and the Chiefs and Bills are on. Um, NFL football. Not rugby. It gave me fucking rugby last time. What the hell is that? What do I look like? Some sort of... Australian, looks at the moon upside down, rides around on the backs of koalas and things. Isn't that what they do there? Anyway. <clears throat> um, all right, so, yeah, absolutely the walrus men selkie mythology is being hinted at in Magic Cat um, with the Manderleys. That's absolutely the case. Uh, they're, they all look like seals and walruses with food stains and curling mustachios and all of the rest of it. They're bald with big whiskers and yeah, so definitely there's Selkie mythology. And check out, in all seriousness, the Nimble Dick Squisher Hunt stream was a lot of fun, but I did have serious content in there. We went through all of the legends of Squishers, Selkies, Merlins, etc. throughout the world, and you can see that they're everywhere. So those legends themselves are evidence of religion. It's not quite the same thing. But generally speaking, the, the myths 
the things that are remembered as being powerful in a given place are going to be, um, you know, tied up with the local religion. So not only do we have these specific religions throughout Westeros, but we also have all the older legends of Selkies and Merlings. So getting back to Garth the Green. <clears throat> this doesn't look right. NFL football. There's like kids news on the screen. What, what the hell is going on here? NFL playoffs. Thank you. Weird. There we go. There's big strong men smashing into each other. All right. So Garth the Green, his religion seems to be a little bit different than the Weirwood worship. Again, they have their own customs that seem to be different from the Weirwoods. If you want to go crazy, you not crazy, but um, you could speculate that this whole, the whole like Garth the Green worship, the living oaken seat throne that he used to sit on, not down in a cave, almost sounds like the first version of how the Weirwood Greenseer magic operated. It is, it is my belief that when I talk about Azor High breaking into the Weirwood Net, this is when the face carving started, that this altered the Weirwoods, and that everything we see now about Weirwood magic is the way it is because of what happened. The blood sacrifice, again, the, the tortured faces that are carved into the Weirwood trees, <clears throat> humans using them for astral projection. I don't think any of that happened before Azor High. Before that... It should have been more like classic nature mythology with green men and children of the forest having happy symbiotic relationships with the trees, using, you know, having psychic connections with them, using them for magic, but without needing to carve weird faces into the trees and to do all this blood magic. Maybe I'm wrong, but I definitely think that's possible. Um, and especially the oaken seat, right? Garth the Green is a green man. He's a king. He's the first chieftain of the first men. And he sits in a living tree throne called the Oaken Seat. It's obviously meant to compare to the living weirwood thrones that the Green Seers sit in. However, it's not in a cave and it's not weirwood. And so this is, this is different. Um, and the other thing is this so, okay, Oak King, Summer King, right? Sometimes the green man is bifurcated into the Oak and the Holly King, with the Holly King being the King of Winter and the Oak King being the Summer King. We've talked about this a lot, so hopefully you're familiar with this. Um, oak is the tree associated with summer, not only in that European folklore setup, but in a lot of places. Um, and so the Weirwoods essentially are taking the place of the Holly. They are the, they are the tree of winter in A Song of Ice and Fire. George never talks about Holly trees but the uh, weirwoods are very strongly associated with winter and the north at this point. So, this idea, the idea of the oak and the holly king is that they kill one another and supplant one another in imitation of the cycle of the seasons, summer and winter supplanting one another. So, if the original green seer magic had to do with oak trees, green men, doing things out in the sunshine, okay, it would kind of make sense. The Weirwoods now represent a Winter King sort of phase where it's in the darkness. They're only relegated mostly to the cold north and there's all this grisly blood sacrifice going on. So a little bit of a theory there, but that's, that's uh, what I think. So we've got green man religion. We've got, you know, uh, sea and sky based religions. These are the two that we know existed before um, the, the, before the conversion over to the Weirwood worship. However, somebody, and I apologize, I can't remember your name. I remembered your comment several days after you left it, and I couldn't go back and find it. Uh, but somebody suggested that perhaps there was fire magic being practiced in ancient Westeros. Now, we know, not we know... <laughs> I've theorized that the Great Empire of the Dawn came to Westeros, which means they would have brought dragons to Westeros, 
and they potentially would have brought fire magic because fire magic and dragons seem to go hand in hand. And the Great Empire of the Dawn built a fused stone fortress on the Isle of Faces. Not, I'm sorry, on um, Battle Isle at Old Town, which means they were using fire sorcery, okay? Now, in the Melisandre Secrets series, I've pointed out that most of the ancient magic of Relorism sounds like it came from the Long Night Battle. Um, the Fire Whites, raised from the dead, can light their swords on fire with their own blood. And we have these... Oh, it was you, Austin Flowers. Good. Oh, I'm glad you're here to take credit then, so I can feel good about this. And damn it, LML, it was me. I have ADD. I can't remember stuff. They get disassociated. I can't remember who I went to concerts with. I, I just, it's just how it is. So in any case, thank you, Austin Flowers, former guest and once and future guest, Austin Flowers. So yes, um, the fire white stuff sounds like very obvious uh, legacy from the War for the Dawn. Uh, as I pointed out, either ice or fire whites are uniquely situated to withstand the cold of the long night in the lands of always winter because they don't need to eat, they don't need to sleep, they don't need to stay warm. Cold whites don't need to be warm and fire whites are always warm. So fire whites or cold whites, ideal to range the very frozen north. We see cold hands putting that into practice. John will probably become a fire white. He's going to range the far north. He's he's John's going to go farther north than... We've seen yet, says George Martin. Well, he's actually, he says that we, the reader, will go farther north than anyone we've seen yet. But I would, I would think that's probably John. Could be Bran. Maybe both. Um, so, the Fire Whites are useful against the others, and they can create flaming swords. This is perhaps where the Azor High flaming sword and the Dragonsteel legend come from. They come from Fire Whites fighting the others with flaming swords. I am the light in the darkness, the sword that... Uh, what is it? Uh, well, like the Sword of the Morning and all that stuff. So then we have the Fire Other process that Melisandre seems to be undergoing. It's also very useful against the Others because she can create the Fire Whites and she can potentially light people's weapons on fire or use other fire magic. Again, check out the Melisandre Secret series. Um, and as Durin Durin did point it out, Night's Queen seems to be like an icy version of Melisandre when you look at it. Her skin is cold as ice, pale as the moon, and she has eyes like blue stars. Melisandre has skin pale as milk, and she has red star eyes. Okay. <clears throat> uh, Melisandre creates black shadow children by taking the seed and soul of Stannis. And Night's Queen, of course, takes the seed and soul of Night's King and makes white shadows the others uh, it says they were sacrificing to the others but we know that means giving your children to the others to be transformed into white walkers the thing is night's queen is already imbued with ice magic so she wouldn't have normal babies her babies would already be halfway on the way to being a white walker or maybe they would literally just be shadows more like melisandre birthing full-grown black shadow entities that could be how what night's queen did Night's Queen also, by the way, might be inside the Weirwood Net. So when she births the Others, that could just be talking about the Others coming out of the Weirwood Trees. Uh, there's several versions of how this could go. But, and check out the creation of the Others and origin of the Others live streams and all the other videos in the Others playlist. Uh, so, Night's Queen, she, the point is, she might be basically an ice priestess. This is Durin Durandin's idea. Someone who, like Melisandre, was born a human, practiced fire magic, or ice magic in this case, over time, and had that magic transform their physiology. That's what's happened with Melisandre. She has practiced fire magic so long that she is now powered by R'hllor, almost 100%. And if that's possible with fire magic, it's possible with ice magic, because we've seen everything in this world is reflective like that. Uh, there's, you know, resurrection and whiteification from every major kind of magic, including green seer magic. That's coming too. You can you can count on that, um, green seer resurrection. So, uh, let's see. What was I saying? Um, 
So I think that people not only were practicing fire magic in ancient Westeros, whether or not it was tied to Relorism, it was probably before Relorism existed. Relorism probably sprung up around the fire magic that was used during the Long Night. That's my guess. Um, but Night's Queen indicates that ice magic was being used too. Because it's like, whatever you think about the creation of the others, it has to start somewhere. Who made Night's Queen if, it, if she wasn't the first? I think she was the first. I think she was, she was, again, like Melisandre, someone who practiced ice magic, became icy, and that made her capable of creating the others when she took the blood of the dragon from Night's King. That blood of the dragon is powerful. She's the ice priestess. And then she flipped that blood of the dragon magic over to ice, essentially. That's what I'm talking about. <clears throat> so, what I'm saying is that people in ancient Westeros, just as they would have created uh, water-based religions around the water magic that Patchface seems to be showing us, and which the Ironborn seemed to remember, the same would be true of any other magical force. If people started messing around or tapping into ice magic, that might create religion. And we see that on the frozen shore, the wildlings worship gods of cold and ice, and Craster considers what he does to be his religion. So worshiping the White Walkers is something you can do, right? Um, Relorism is, again, fire magic. I suspect that both raw ice and fire worship probably would have been happening in ancient Westeros. The ice magic we kind of know was happening in the north, and the fire magic would have been brought there by the Great Empire of the Dawn, if nothing else. <clears throat> so, <clears throat> those are two more possibilities for ancient religions of Westeros, of the first men, before... Uh, before the, uh, they converted to worship of the Weirwoods. Um, Austin Flowers also pointed out that when they talk about the first men giving the Weirwoods to the fire, it almost sounds like giving people to the fire when Melisandre does it. It's not just burning them down, giving them to the fire, as though the fire were a, a sacred thing. Um, so <clears throat> that kind of fits with the idea that the first men who were cutting down the Weirwoods and antagonizing the children... They were Team Dragonlord, Team Azor High, and that Night's Queen and the children making the White Walkers is a reaction to Azor High's invasion. So that kind of gets you the whole ice and fire mix right there. <clears throat> and uh, let's see, what was where was I, what was I saying? Yeah, well, just that. If you can see the the setup for both raw ice and fire magic being used in ancient Westeros, uh, just like the water magic and just like the Gartha Green worship. So that gives us four different religions that could have been and probably were in Westeros. And then we've... It's like, so what, what else could there be? Um, just random little beliefs, I guess, that, that we don't really hear about. But that's that's really, those are the possibilities. Um, yeah. So John Merkel, yeah, that's what I was saying. The first men could have been originally Dawn Empire dragon people who walked there through the north. That's an interesting idea. Um, and again, check out uh, The Starks Are Not First Men from the Westeros.org forums. I believe that's by Lord Martin. That was definitely a cool essay that influenced me back in the day. So guys, if you have any questions, let me know. Because I'm probably going to wrap up here soon. My voice is pretty tired. And, uh, yeah. Got to get back to uh, working on this video. <clears throat> By the way, I want to give a quick shout out to An American Thinks. This is a YouTube channel. It's called An American Thinks. And he's got a sort of a slow burning essay series. Um, he, unlike me, he's not a full time YouTuber. It's just something he's doing on the side. But he's, he's a deep thinker. 
And his series is really cool. It's called uh, something about the master plan theory of everything. They're the main videos on his channel, which is called An American Thinks. He just put out part seven uh, a couple days ago. I was, thought it was really good. He's only got, he doesn't only have that many subscribers, like 4,000 or something like that. So if you like uh, my kind of analysis, you probably would like An American Thinks. So go on over to his channel and check out his videos. And uh, another uh, channel that I've been watching lately is uh, Crec and Ford, and that's C-R-E-C-G-A-N-F-O-R-D. And he is doing videos about world mythology, and he's really good. He's got a small channel, too, that's just growing, and he's, he's really on point with the Indo-European mythology, Norse mythology, and... Uh, was talking about Tiamat and uh, biblical mythology that's based on Mesopotamian mythology, and he's really good. So I want to share his channel with y'all, too, just in case you want stuff to watch. So there's Crec and Ford's channel. And, uh, yeah. Let me check the Nimble Doc real quick, see if I missed any PayPal's from back earlier in the stream. Feel pretty good about it, but that doesn't mean I didn't miss something. Um, let's see, yeah, Michael James and the Wayward White Walker both sent in uh, super stickers that I missed, it looks like. Okay, I'm up to date on the questions, cool. Well, I'll just play my theremin for the heck of it. I feel like the wizard Tim just sort of occasionally firing off blasts of fire at random mountains for, for no reason. <clears throat> um, okay, here's a good point uh, from Louisa Luz talking about cannibalism. There is a lot of cannibalism in A Song of Ice and Fire. Bloodstone Emperor was said to practice it. Uh, we've seen it amongst the wildlings and first men. Nightford has cannibalism stories. I think this is sort of an old animistic idea that George is tying into where you can eat the flesh of someone powerful in order to gain their power. Um, Vermeer eats Hagen's heart to gain his power. So I don't know if that's a religion. It's definitely a religious belief. Um, it's something that I think you find in a lot of different, again, sort of animistic cultures. So George could be implying that the wildlings have religions like that that just don't have like a name or a description quote unquote but i do think it ties into um blood magic in general there you go espalier knows about an american thinks very cool very cool Ah, uh, yeah, the children of the forest are practicing some sort of cannibalism with that weird paste. Yeah, that's also true. <clears throat> so I think that's just kind of a blood magic thing. It's a way to tap into the power of, of magic blood. It's by eating people. Singer stew, yeah, singer stew. There's... Uh, there's lots of cannibalism, <laughs> lots of cannibalism. So like I said, guys, last call for questions, then I'm going to go ahead and wrap it up <clears throat> and get back to work on this Ice Spiders video, or maybe take a nap. Yes, I'm working on the Ice Spiders. It's going to be tasty. It's going to be tasty. I'm really excited about the video. I'm so excited, I didn't even mind recording it twice. So, it's going to be an hour with ice spiders. I mean, you might think, how is he going to talk about ice spiders for an hour? Well, it dovetails into spider symbolism, weaving symbolism, and eventually the weirwoods and the white walkers. So, there's plenty to talk about. I basically will have a new theory about the others at the end of it.
Man, the kid upstairs is wailing. Wailing. That's what happens when you don't discipline very often and then you come down with a lot of discipline all at once. Kids don't know what to expect. Parenting corner with LML. Not going to be a recurring feature. LML is not a parent. I'm only a bird parent. <clears throat> Were there weirwoods in Essos? That's a good question. We haven't seen any. We've seen um, weirwood used at the House of Black and White for the doors and chairs. And of course, there are the shade of the evening trees. So that's really the question. Are the shade of the evening trees... <laughs> Austin Flowers, I didn't know you lived downstairs for me. <laughs> <clears throat> Spare the rod and spoil the child, as they say. Actually, no, you shouldn't beat your children. I take that back. Um, that's a, yeah. Okay, so what was I saying? The, the shade of the evening trees, they obviously could be related to the weirwoods. They could be transformed weirwoods, similar species, something like that. I tend to think about them primarily as symbolism. They're, they symbolize the idea of frozen or dead weirwood trees, which is something I'm going to talk about in the White Walkers video. <clears throat> but as far as what they actually are, it's hard to say. It's, it's tempting to speculate, but it's, it's just hard to say. I think if it were important, well, there's also the Ifakevron. We know that the Ifakevron sound like children of the forest, and they were in the forest north of, well, the, the forest of the Ifakevron. It's north of the Dothraki Grass Sea. So they were either using, there aren't reports of weirwoods in that forest, but there are, did they talk about, yeah, faces carved in trees, so... They're either using different trees or there are weirwoods in that forest. And this goes back to the idea that maybe oak trees can also be used for magic. And maybe the original magic trees were even oak trees. Uh, let's see. John Merkel says to dovetail on the Karth video, just before the ancient Karth part of the world book, it talks about the spider goddess in an endless war with the serpent god. Yes. Um, two people are fighting over the weirwood net, the green seers and the others. The others are symbolized by the spiders, the ice spiders, and the green seers are symbolized by the serpent because the green seers are mostly dragon associated, blood raven, the original Azor High. Um, so I think that's what that's about, but it's also a reference to a Robert E. Howard Conan thing as well. Michael James, what type of trees did the Ephekevron carve? We don't know, it is not said. But let's look up the exact quote, since I'm kind of like, uh, I don't know, maybe, I can't remember quite. Let's see here. Oh, I got to look up Woods Walkers. Which is another clue about White Walkers and children being related. Another name, a name for the children of the forest in a different continent is Woods Walkers. And the White Walkers are the White Walkers of the wood. So. <clears throat> so, uh, yes, the Maesters straight out say that they are diminutive folk who many Maesters believe to have been kin to the children of the forest. Um... And it says, Corlys Valerian was the first Westerosi to visit these woods. After his return from the Thousand Islands, he wrote of carved trees, haunted grottos, and strange silences. So that's really all it says, other than that name, those who walk in the woods. So we don't know. Uh, people left them offerings of leaf and stone and water overnight. That is exactly like the tradition of the Nis. Nis people in Scandinavia, which I've talked about a bunch of times as evidence that Nissa Nissa was a child of the forest. And the Dothraki having revered the Woodswalkers is a clue that potentially uh, the ancient Dothraki would have been horse skin changers and that the sort of sacred bond between man and horse that the Dothraki have is an echo of when they skin changed horses. I talked about that in the Origins of the Dothraki video. And then Danny Boy says, 
Do you think the High Towers were influenced by the Great Empire of the Dawn religion? They worship in the fortification left by the Great Empire. Yes, good, good point, Danny boy. I gave you a creative theremin blast for that one. So, yes, the High Towers reek of starry wisdom, don't they? That high tower is nothing but a big scrying tower. That's so Lord Leighton Hightower can sing to the stars, just like the starry wisdom practitioners. He hasn't come down in 10 years. He likes those stars so much. There's obvious comparisons to Saruman and the Palantir and Orthanc. So this implies that... I mean, it's even said that Lord Hightower and his daughter, uh, Melora the Mad Maid, <clears throat> are reading the Book of Spells up there. So, yeah, they're doing magic up there, and it's said that maybe he'll summon an army from the deeps, which is just a crazy idea, sort of laying around Old Town, that maybe you can summon the squishers. But whatever he's doing up in that tower, it's, it's something magical. It definitely could be Starry Wisdom stuff. Marwyn the Mage is Starry Wisdom cult. We're told that Starry Wisdom cult uh, flourishes in uh, port cities, High Towers, uh, Old Town is an obvious bet for it. So yeah, Lord Leighton very well could be Starry Wisdom Church, and there's probably a tradition of that in Old Town. In fact, um, uh, there are legends of dragon slayers in the Reach, and then in the appendix of one of the books, you can't even search it in A Search of Ice and Fire, it says that um, the old high towers they were dragon dragon slayers and demon hunters. Um, so, like, there's definitely a lot of clues about the high towers having occult magic that doesn't really have anything else in common with anything else in Westeros. That would definitely be from the Great Empire of the Dawn and their astronomy-based religion. So, here we have a fifth ancient religion that predates the Green Seers. Thank you very much, Danny boy. I don't know how I missed that. Uh, I sort of mentioned the idea of starry wisdom, but I forgot about the high towers. The high towers, yeah, they, they, would, be the, they would be the ones. So, very cool. Ask your doctor if once a day, if a Kevron is right for you. Yeah, it does sort of sound like that. <laughs> All right. Yeah, the high towers are witchers, exactly. Yeah, totally. I have watched Witcher Season 2, and I will be uh, making Rhaegar Show Season 2, by the way. And let me just check on PayPal's real quick. Yeah, it says I got one from Melinda. It just hasn't showed up yet in my regular email. There it is. Yes, from Melinda. Thank you, Melinda. Go Chiefs, she says. Yeah, I think I'm pulling for the Chiefs. Actually, I think I'm really just curious to see who wins. Um, looks like we're going to go into halftime, tied, 14 all. Unless Mahomes can pull a little something out of his pocket. Now they might try to kick a field goal. All right. There you go. Well, thank you very much. Oh, and that fat man, Squisher member for four months, says... Wild idea here. Could it be that the Great Empire of the Dawn actually came after the Long Night, making the Long Night far older than we think? No, because the Great Empire of the Dawn, the whole reason they need to be there is because of the War for the Dawn and the Long Night. That's where the dragon steel of the last hero comes from. That's where the Lightbringer myth meets up with dragon steel. Um, that's what makes sense of all the Azor High Knight's King symbolism. Um, the idea that the, the, the Dawn might have been Lightbringer and it's in the hands of the Danes who are Great Empire of the Dawn descendants. No. So the Great Empire of the Dawn, they need to be there for the time of the Long Night and the Fused Stone Fortress is built underneath the oldest version of the High Tower, which means the Great Empire of the Dawn was there first before anything else. So they are first. They are before the first men. That is even suggested by the Maesters that seafaring traders came to Old Town before the first men, and that was the Great Empire of the Dawn. So, that is what I will say. I feel like I can be definitive with that answer. Uh, 
Yeah, it's the Andals who came much later. Stupid Andals. All right. Yeah, if you want to see me get worked up, try throwing those the Andals were here first theories. The Andals were here during the Long Night theories are specifically made by people who don't know about the Great Empire of the Dawn and are looking at some of the mysteries of the Great Empire of the Dawn presence and coming up with the wrong answer, which is Andals. Um, so that's what I have to say about that. But I tackled that one also in the Timeline Heresies, The Pact and the Hammer of the Waters. So... Yeah, Michael, I can't wait to see what the high towers pull out. Um, I did a really fun Winds of Winter preview with Quinn's ideas about Old Town and the high towers. So check that out on the Winds of Winter playlist. <clears throat> All right, guys, I'm going to go ahead and wrap it up there. Thank you very much for joining me. Again, thank you for everyone who donated to the computer fund. I have the new computer. All my problems are solved, except for I'm still getting my fonts like active and stuff i've got a couple of small issues but yes the computer runs great did this whole live stream with no cpu issues no overheating no crazy fan noise nothing so thanks you guys came through for me i have a new computer i am happily working on the ice spiders video now and uh, i'll have that to you in early february so yeah there you go guys uh minty you're back just in time for me to say goodbye so have a good day at work sweetheart have a great Sunday, the rest of y'all. And uh, yeah, I love all of y'all. So I'll see you again next Sunday or maybe even before that.